The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Hello, and welcome to a place for new ways of thinking and doing. This is Innovation Workshop. The electronic circuit is an innovation that has impacted our culture more than anything else this past century. From self-driving cars, to the most advanced rockets, to the cell phone in your pocket, the electronic circuit is the biggest small thing around. An electronic circuit contains many different components. These components are separate parts that can be used to control the electric current. Over time, electronic circuits have improved as new components have been invented and improved. An electric circuit is a path for electrons to flow. A battery or other source of electrical energy gives the force, or voltage, to start the movement. The rate of the flow is called the current. In a series circuit, the current has only one path to move. If one component stops working, the current stops. But, in a parallel circuit, there is more than one pathway. Components are parts that can be added to build a more complex circuit. Remember, the circuit needs to be complete. All the connections from the power source need to return back again. Here is one of the first high vacuum tubes that started us on the way to the wonders of our electronic age. See, the vacuum tube was an early electronic component. Kind of looks like, and works like, a light bulb. The electric current moves between electrodes in an airtight container. It strengthened the electric current, which enabled more complex circuits to be created. This led to new technologies. Hundreds of them were installed as amplifiers, thus making possible the first telephone line between New York and San Francisco. And 3,000-mile transcontinental telephone calls became a reality. Radio broadcasts, television, and military radar were technologies that quickly developed as a result of the vacuum tube. Even early computers used vacuum tubes. The ENAC was proclaimed to be a giant brain that could solve the most complex calculations. Though it was said all the lights in Philadelphia dimmed when it was powered on. See, vacuum tubes require too much energy. They easily overheat and need lots of space for ventilation. In 1948, the solution was invented at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. This is the first transistor. Though it looks too crude and bulky to be considered electronics, this transistor paved the way for all the electronics in your life. Arising from basic research on solid substances and how the electrons inside them behave. How did it all come about? Well, doctors Shockley, Bardeen, and Bratton, and their associates at the Bell Telephone Laboratories we're working on a problem in pure research, investigating the surface properties of germanium, a substance known to be a semiconductor of electricity. Their study suggested a way to amplify an electric current within a solid, without a vacuum or a heating element. And after months of calculations, experiments, tests, the transistor was born. These scientists won a Nobel Prize for the invention of the first point contact transistor, which replaced the need for vacuum tubes and there were many variations that soon followed. The transistor is far more energy efficient than a vacuum tube. It can be packaged into a smaller container to be compact without the problem of overheating. This is how my voice would sound over a 75 mile telephone line that has no amplifying device. Now, with a transistor amplifier in the line, my voice is amplified so that you can hear me distinctly. Transistors are considered to be the most important technological innovation of this past century. So why exactly are they so amazing? Because they have two functions, to strengthen the electric signal and to act as a switch. The switch is actually the coolest part, on or off, one or zero. This switching function enables the use of binary code, which is a number system used to process information. It is the language of computers. Here's the word hello in binary code. See, all computers speak in ones and zeros. Even colors have binary code, like this. So every color you see and every word you read on an electronic device is a result of binary code processing that information. So how exactly does a transistor work? Well, you'll probably need an advanced degree in physics or electrical engineering like these people to learn how to really design one. Essentially, 
A transistor has three different layers that are each connected to the circuit. The electric charge flows through until a voltage is applied from another connection. This pinches the electric current and shuts off the switch. There are different kinds of transistors, and scientists are still studying semiconductor materials to better control the movement of electrons. Over time, transistors have become smaller and smaller. In fact, they're so small that the human eye or even your school's microscope can't see them. This small size enables them to be packaged inside a microchip. And if you can pack more transistors into a microchip, then you can process more information at faster rates. It's all about processing speed and ability. Consider this. In 1974, this microchip was the first commercially available microprocessor. Inside, it had 2,300 transistors and was used in this calculator. Compare that to one of the newest microprocessors that has over 7 billion transistors. With it, you can add filters to 1,400 Instagram pics in one minute watch the highest definition movies while shopping online or play one of your favorite games. Oh yeah, it can also run a calculator. Transistors switching an electric current on and off to process information is an essential part of your everyday life. Innovation Workshop's student reporter, Ariana, took a closer look at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. So this is the uh, focused ion beam system, the laser-induced fluorescence. And then we actually bring another laser in and we ionize them, we do photoionization. Sometimes we get uh, Rydberg states that we ionize. And the lithium ions come down the column and they focus to a really tiny spot on the sample. Ariana, Ariana, did you catch that? Uh, oops, hashtag phone addiction. I think it's time you understand the hashtag technology that's inside your hashtag obsession. So let's open up this phone and see what's inside. What do you think? Okay. All right. Okay, so now we got the cover off. Here's some parts that are inside. There's the battery and here's a circuit board. Now, some people who take their phones apart maybe get this far, see the batteries, but we're gonna go way deeper. So let's, let's get this circuit board out and take a look at it. Now see here on the back side, see those black things? Those are integrated circuits and inside them is a whole world of smaller and smaller circuits. Now if you take a look at this here, this is another example of a circuit, but this is a big one, okay? And, but it's got chips on it too. And inside those chips, are small circuits too. So the world of electronics gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So look at all the different types of chips we have. We got some really big ones. This one is actually from a long time ago. This is uh, from the 1980s. But um, inside here, there's the same sort of chips. Here's a really tiny one. Take a look at that one. See how small it is? That's like the one that's in your phone. So all the electrical components are in that one chip. Well, let's say lots and lots, millions of components are in there. These are actually building blocks. So in, on this chip, there are millions and millions of components, transistors, resistors, and capacitors. But usually a, something like a phone will have several of these chips and they're connected to each other. That's the way these complicated electronics are constructed out of components that are put together. So here's another chip. This is the one we're gonna take apart. Let's open this one up. Awesome. The actual chip inside is very delicate and it has to be protected. You're going to see when we get this open. Oh, starting to peel up there. Yeah, see you it. see that? You want to take a whack at this? Here. Sure. Give it, give it a try. I'm just put it in. Forgive me, I'm left handed. So oh, that's, that's very awkward. That's okay. Oh, there, there it goes. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Good shot. All right. Now take a look at that. See what's inside there? Oh, I see, see it. See this chip? That's an example of a chip. Now what I've got over here, this is how they actually make those things. Look at the size of this. This oh. is a 12-inch wafer. And you see on there are hundreds and hundreds of little chips just like that one. Now what's kind of mind-blowing about this is that inside each of those squares, there's lots of them here, inside each one is still millions and millions of circuit elements. 
transistors and resistors and everything like that. Now we're going to go over to a microscope and take a look at that. So this is the optical microscope. Here's the chip. If you look up on the screen, you can see there's the wafer we were looking at inside there. The first thing you notice, it's got all these little wires. Those are tiny wires. They're just like hairs, right? But those are bringing the electrical circuitry in from the outside. And then on the chip, you start to see it's like a city on there almost. Oh, yeah, I can kind of see a pattern. And once you zoom in on here, you can start seeing that there's a lot of complexity as you go deeper and deeper in here. And uh, you can try to focus a little bit. You can start to see over here that there's, there's stuff there, but you can't quite see it. And the reason that is, it's getting smaller than the wavelength of the light. And you just can't see it that well anymore. Let's get a closer look with the electron microscope. So what kind of microscope is this, and why is it important that we use a stronger one? This is a scanning electron microscope, and it gives you a 3D topography image. And you see that the three-dimensional pictures of bugs, they were taken with a scanning electron microscope. The electron beam will hit the sample, and we're going to image the electrons that were scattered off the surface. Uh, so with our chip here that you gave me, I've got it mounted on the wafer plate. Um, we'll actually put it in the microscope and look at the surface. So this is the chip that you saw in the optical microscope, and you were able to see the leads in the optical microscope, and so we can see those here as well. I can change my magnification and go up quite a bit. Now we can start to see this detail. Okay. You can see all the different lines. You can see that they're raised off the surface a bit. You can see there's holes inside these squares. So I can go up again. Now you can see at, we're at 3,000 times magnification. You can see some vertical lines. You can see this bumpy, bumpy surface. Here's horizontal lines that are not as tall as the vertical lines or underneath the vertical lines. So when I send a text message through my phone, does it go through that pattern? Well, yeah, it does actually, but what it does is it first gets converted into ones and zeros, and those ones and zeros turn into little electrical pulses, and the electrical pulses spread out and fan out through all these conductors. Those are actually wires on the chip. So yeah, your text is going flying through there all the time. So why is it such an intricate pattern? Is that the path of the electrons? Well, it's intricate because it takes a lot of different ones and zeros switches turning on and off to process all the digital data that gets transmitted. So those things don't look like much, but those are actually the transistors and resistors and everything that make up the circuit. They look like just little rectangles and all that, but that's all they really need to be. They're all connected in special ways, but that's what makes the circuit. Thanks for the in-depth look. Oh, you're welcome. Um, but can I get my phone back? I have to tweet about this. Well, okay. I hope it works. <laughs> and when you do tweet, make sure you think about all those electrons that are flying around in there in all the circuits deep inside that phone. Smartphones are only as smart as the science and technology inside them.